Okay, we're back with the Social Entrepreneur Podcast. It's 2019. My first guest of the year for a new course, Introduction to Social Entrepreneurship, is Dan Giusti, founder of Brigade, or Chef's Brigade, which provides delicious food to public high schools. All schools, all, all public schools. schools, so K through 12, yeah. And you started off as the head, well, not started off, but your last <laughs> yeah. job was the head chef at Noma, right? which is the number one restaurant in the world. Right where billionaires jet off to for lunch. <laughs> yeah. So how did you get from there to here? Yeah. Well, I think, um, you know, long story short, uh, I got into cooking at a young age, and when you're ambitious as a chef, it takes you into fine dining. That's what you get into. And basically, from the start of my career until I became the head chef at Noma, that's what it was about. But uh, the reason I got into cooking in the first place was probably really never about fine dining or, or, or cooking in that way. And until I got there and, be, and became the head chef there, did I have the confidence to decide kind of how I really wanted to cook, okay. um, which was for more people and kind of in a different way to really take care of them and to feed them. So that's kind of what led me into cooking in institutions. And what was the problem that you were trying to solve? Um, essentially that, you know, everybody talks about nutrition when it comes to school food. Uh, anyone who's, most people who are providing food in schools are operating with the same nutritional guidelines. So it's, it's kind of a moot point. Really, the problem is that the food doesn't taste good, so kids don't eat it. Um, so that was our goal, is to involve chefs into this process and to make this nutritious food taste good. So it's not that kids aren't eating healthy food, it's that they're not eating? That's right. So it, it, if you can imagine, not only are kids not eating, but there are kids who really need to eat and they're hungry and they still choose not to eat because they really don't see anything that looks favorable to them. So um, that's really the biggest problem. If in, in anyone spends any time in any school cafeteria across the country these days, you would see a lot of food getting wasted. Okay, so tell us a little bit about how you were able to go into a public institution like a school district and work with all the different stakeholders there when you're coming fresh off a plane from Copenhagen. Yeah, I think first of all, Coming from, and this is kind of an unfair advantage, but coming from this notable restaurant, people will at the very least hear you out. You'll get an opportunity to speak to people, which which obviously um, some people don't even get that opportunity. So I felt very fortunate to have that. And then once you get in the door and you have the opportunity and you have stakeholders in front of you that are going to listen, I think it's a matter of just recognizing where they're coming from, the challenges that they're facing. Um, what this issue means to them particularly and make sure that when you're speaking to them that you, you speak to them in, in, in kind of those ways and be respectful to the fact that there probably are a lot of people who've worked very hard within this space and, you know, you could talk about it all day as a problem you're trying to solve, but you have to be very careful about that. Going yeah. into a space where people are working hard to do something and then you recognize it as a problem. I think it's important to recognize that the way things are set up is really the problem, and they're working in that space. That's a um, good point. And, and that's really the truth. So when we went in, it was like, look, we can see you're working really hard. We can see there's a lot of things at play here. The way the system's set up, it makes it very difficult to make change. We feel like we can bring something to the table that can help you overcome that. So that's really the, the approach that and we take. And you weren't going in as a nonprofit. You started a business and you right. were selling them. Right. You wanted to get the contract, right? That's right. So we are we are a for-profit business and, and primarily because I want this to go to scale and I don't want anything to get in our way. And that was the reason initially for being a for-profit business. But I will say that... You know, schools should value this work. Schools should value food service. And that's something, and that's primarily one of the main reasons where food service in schools is not where it should be because it's not valued. So it's really important to me that schools uh, find ways to pay for this. They should allocate money within a budget, albeit a very tight budget. But th there is money there, and it's a matter of allocating more money to food service. And, and quite frankly, the way that the food service program works is that the primarily all of that money doesn't even come out of the general budget anyway. So it's it, food it, specific. It's food specific. So it's a little bit of a complicated thing, but anyway, it's the idea that there is value to this. Spending money on this should be something that people aren't afraid of. There shouldn't be the only way to do this should not be that it's just subsidized by a nonprofit or someone else. It should yeah. be like we should pay for this. It's important. And were you replacing an existing company that they were paying to cook? Right. So the way, again, in, in, in food service in schools, there's primarily two ways it can happen. One of which is being self-operating where the school district handles everything themselves. The other would be to take in a vendor that would handle everything. Um, up to now, we've partnered with school districts that are doing it themselves. 
um, which we feel that it's a nice relationship to have. Okay. Yeah, and that's a model that, for a lot of reasons, not not only from a business perspective, logistically, seems to make a lot of sense to us. But it must be even harder to convince them, right? Yes and no. I think um, typically the relationship, if you're an outside vendor, you come in and you take over the whole process, which is pretty invasive, meaning there's, there's school districts that if you speak to the, food, the superintendent and ask them about the finances of the food service program, they might not even know that information because everything is handled by that outside company, um, which obviously as, as someone in control of a school district, you want to know everything about what's happening. Um, our model is a lot less invasive in the sense that everyone really is, remains their staff, their employee, we come in and we work with them to kind of elevate that. So it's still entirely under their control. They know what's happening. They know who's who. And I think it just makes more sense, not only for us, but primarily for the school district. Okay. So do you ask them to pay more? Is that part of your pitch? Uh, no. It sounds expensive to me. Yeah. I, I mean, I would say if, if you spoke to the average person who's working in school food service and we talked about our fee structure, they would look at it as this seems expensive. Um, We've gone through various stages where our, our model that we started with was probably even more robust, more expensive, um, and we've gone now further down, um, not in quality. I think we've just distilled our model to a point where we're not offering extra things that don't make as much sense or as much impact. Therefore, we can charge less. But probably in a lot of schools, again, they would recognize this as, as money that seems maybe not in line with what they're used to spending. Um, with that said, um, just to be Quite frank, um, our current model is basically, you could put it in a nutshell to say that to transition a school from primarily processed foods to primarily scratch cooking mm -hmm. um, costs $30,000. And a lot of people would look at that as way too much money. But if you really put it into perspective and That's think about... That's the only difference between... Yeah, and you might incur, depending on your facilities, there could be some other costs depending on what you have. But really, that's the main fee we charge. You can argue, again, that seems like a lot, and a lot of schools would argue this is a lot of money, and I can understand that. But if you really put it into perspective, changing the food service for a school, one school, but that could be a 1,000 kids a yeah. day, every day, and it's changed forever, meaning you're setting up this kitchen to be something different for the future. It's not a lot of money. Yeah. And if you continue to make it cheaper and cheaper, you can do that but you're not really going to make the real impact. And at that point, I don't really see the, the value in that. So at the end of the day, the kids are your customers, right? They're your end right. user, but they're not the ones paying for it. Right. So how do you cater to all these needs and all these stakeholders? It's, it's, it's really difficult because I think in the end, everybody needs to understand that the only person that matters in this whole equation are the kids. I mean, we could talk about everybody, the parents, the teachers, the administrators, I mean, I will say, outside of the kids, it's really the staff in the kitchens that mean a lot to me as far as making sure this is di directly affects their job. So they're very important in this equation as well. But in the end, it's, uh, but they understand too, in the end, it's about the kids. And as you said, they're not the ones that are making the noise, really, usually. I mean, they'll tell us directly if they don't like something or, or if they do like something. But it's quite often that you have a lot of people saying what should be served to kids and what shouldn't be served to kids that aren't really involved in it so much and don't really see it. Um, so it can be difficult. And I think it's a matter of us working with the kids, being with the kids, understanding what the kids want, what they enjoy, what they don't enjoy, and then being confident with that and being deliberate in what we're doing and make sure we're confident when we explain to people why we're doing what we're doing. And I feel very confident that we have reasons why we do everything. So we're usually in a position to have a very good answer as to why we do certain things. And I think that's important. And I think that's yeah. one thing we've done well. So how do you make it work as a business in terms of your impact driven, but mm -hmm. you're for profit? Have right. you been able to break even yet? Right. So we haven't broken even yet. Um, and how I've, many years has it been? We're in our third year. Okay. And we didn't take on investment until the end of our second year. So we just recently kind of took on investment. Um, our costs were pretty low, and they continue to be relatively low. Um, but I will say the first couple of years were very much rooted in just figuring out what we're doing. And now we're kind of developing the model, and I think really what guides us anyway in the end is doing what makes the most sense to make the most impact, and I think then reverting back to understanding, obviously keeping some reason in there. We're not going to just do things off the handle and tank the company, but 
If you can see how some way this will make financial sense, then just do it. There's so many hurdles already in this space that if we're waiting for it to make complete financial sense yeah. right away, then we're never going to do anything. And what do you see as your vision for scaling in terms of not just reaching more children and more schools, but changing the way the school system operates? Yeah, I think... <sighs> so I wouldn't say scaling, but rather growing your impact. Yeah, I think, again, it's, it's, it's a, there's a lot of phases to this process. And I think one thing and one mistake we made from the beginning was trying to change too much at once. And you start to lose people, and it doesn't make sense to everyone. And what you're doing needs to make sense to everyone. You talk about stakeholders. It needs to make sense to everyone. It can't just make sense to the few parents who eat a certain way at home, and they're happy that their chef's around. That, that doesn't work. Everyone in the process needs to, needs to understand why we're doing this and the importance of it. And that might mean taking it a little slower to keep it, everybody on board and building it. And then probably most importantly, building it up in individual communities. Instead of looking at it as this giant scalable model that's going to go yeah. into all these places simultaneously, it's more like these are the basics to what we're trying to achieve. Put it into a place and let it grow in that place. And if everybody is on board, inevitably it will. And don't get me wrong, the impact will be greater in some places than in other places. But I think you also have the potential for it to, to scale and grow in a way that if you kept complete control over it, would never get there. Right. You mentioned in class that over time you're asking the schools to contribute more. Right. Which is building their capacity and yes. lowering your costs. Right. And increasing the overall impact. That's right. I think, you know, our initial model was very much built on this idea that we're going to come in, we're going to charge you X amount of money, and we're going to be here forever. And we're just going to be here and... and from a business perspective, obviously this sounds good, it's this perpetual cost, but the one thing we realize is that, you know, what we're trying to do is basically serve the best food possible for kids. So obviously the more money we charge the schools over the more amount of time is the less money that they have to really work with to make the best food possible. So we recognize that there were some redundancies in what we do and what they have the capability to do. So we said, look, you should do more of this, we'll do less of that, we'll charge you less in turn. We will build your capability and capacity, and then over time, we go away. Everybody wins. Yep. So are you able to share with us any of the comments or feedback you get from the kids, or <laughs> yeah. is it all, you know, swear words? <laughs> there are some swear words, but there are some that aren't that are just as impactful as far as uh, you can understand how they hurt are things like try harder when you ask for like when maybe you that's what their teachers tell them maybe <laughs> like you ask for feedback on a written thing and someone writes try harder or i received an email uh this year which was really tough to hear and it was thanks for nothing was the title <laughs> and it's from a student basically saying how we've made all of their meals terrible and that the staff is taking the blame for all this and that's terrible and you need you guys need to start from scratch start from zero and rework this whole model so, it's, I mean, it, it's not uncommon to hear really, really tough comments, and that's fine. Um, the problem is, is we just want to hear more specific feedback. That doesn't help us very much. It's very <laughs> hard for, I mean, maybe, maybe there's just no winning with that person, but um, we want to hear things like, okay, this is bad because, because all we're trying to do is make the food for them. We will listen. And we've had some success stories where people say, can you do this more like this? And then we change it, and it blows their mind. Because they're like a 12-year-old kid who asks for something to change, and then it changes for the whole school. Um, but I will say, uh, you definitely need to have a thick skin to work in this uh, and space. And these are kids who might be starving, but might still refuse to eat right. food. Yeah, And, and they should have that choice. Exactly. And as I mentioned in class, I've kind of gathered this feeling from people, this idea that if people are starving and they don't have much to eat, then they shouldn't be so picky about what they're eating. And it like blows my mind. Meaning like if we have kids that are hungry and we give them a lot of options, they should be able to choose one of them. It's like, well, if none of them look good to them, then they should have that choice. And I will tell you that some of our worst days have been times where we offered meals because we thought they were good and we were excited about them because we're chefs <laughs> and we know what we're doing. And then you, and we, in the process took some things off the menu because we thought they were below us, they were too simple, and then see kids who choose not to eat. That breaks your heart, and you realize you've made a big mistake. It sounds like you're doing a great job altogether, and we're so inspired by your work. Thank, Thank you, you so much for being with us Thank today. you. My pleasure.